Okay, so we're now um, two past one. So I might just kick off with a short introduction and then I'll let um, Peter take over. We'll just get people to join us as they um, arrive there. Um, Peter, if you're around, just want to make sure. Great, cool. Right here. Fantastic, great. Well, thank you again for doing this session for us. Um, I'll just do a quick introduction on um, TSL Lunch and Learns, who we are, and uh, for those who um, have, if this is the first time they're actually joining us for a Lunch and Learn session today. So my name is Anita Beckham and I'm the head of events at Tankstream Labs. So for those who aren't familiar with Tankstream Labs, we are a co-working space for tech startups with a global focus. Now we began our journey back in 2012 uh, when Tim Fung, the co-founder and CEO of Airtasker as well, um, wanted a place for him and his um, entrepreneurial friends to work and collaborate out of. And that's how Tankstream Labs was born in 2012. Now we exist to support the innovation and growth of the startup ecosystem. Now, as part of our community, we do offer lunch and learn series um, and professional development um, sessions for our members. Generally, these are exclusive to members, but during these times, we have opened up a few of these sessions um, to the general public as well, so including today's session. Now, love to introduce our um, speaker and uh, speaker of today. So sales acceleration specialist, Peter Strokov, um, who will run you through uh, the lunch and lunch session. And if you do want more information or more um, events and content like this, please head to our website at tankstreamlabs.com. So Peter, I will hand over to you and just let everyone know the logistics today. Sorry, I should have started with that. Um, it will run, so we'll run till about two o'clock or so today. Um, if you have any questions, there is a Q&A box down the bottom of your screen. Um, please pop your questions through there and Peter will be able to answer them during the session. Um, and the session is also recorded and we are live on Facebook now. So if you do want to revisit the content, feel free to go through our website, tankstreamlabs.com to see that. Now I hand over to Peter. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Anita. Great job. Well done. Thank you. And great to be here, everybody. Thank you for having me and thank you for um, spending your time your lunchtime with me today. I hope uh, I can do it justice and give you a lot of uh, value from today's session. Uh, also just um, continuing from what Anita said about further information down the bottom of this page, you, you can see the, um, the website where you can also get more information about uh, you know, the services that, that are available to you and, and, uh, and some of my, my blog articles and you know, lots, of, um, lots of value there. So the, um, I've, I've started this off with a little bit of a hopefully amusing picture for you that's saying that um, you know, we'll, we'll really need to know what works and not just what doesn't work. So hopefully I can help you get some clarity on that uh, today. So thank you again for, for, uh, for joining me. Okay. So I, I just want to talk briefly about myself. I'm not going to go into much detail. But the, um, the idea is that I've spent you know, quite a bit of time, 20 years in, in the corporate sector and, uh, and then started my own um, advisory business, helping to accelerate sales. So that my motto is more sales faster. And that kind of says everything. And there's three different ways that I do that. One is I help sales and marketing to come together and work as one and uh, get more from the, from the sum of the parts. I help you to accelerate well so firstly to have a sales funnel secondly to structure it and then thirdly to accelerate a sales funnel we'll be talking some more about that today so that you get more sales faster and then thirdly once you have a good sales funnel then i'll help you put the good leads into the top so that uh, you get uh, more more prospects turning into customers and uh, and that's that's pretty much it i did have a much longer version of this talking about the two books that i've written and my my public appearances and and my media and, and the, that I am a guest lecturer at the um, Sydney Business School, et cetera, et cetera. But I think I'll spare you all that. That's, um, you know, you, you don't need to know <laughs> that much about me, really. Uh, it's it's uh, more important that I can add value, uh, add value to you, which, speaking of which, is that now in the new normal, in the new selling environment, um, things are probably not going to go um, the same way as they did in 2019. So we need a, a new plan. And, and by the way, as we go through this, um, I'm, I'm very receptive to you asking questions and, and uh, typing them into the question box there. And I'll, I'll either answer them as you pose them or come back to them at the end. So please uh, feel free to, to ask your questions. All right, so let's talk about sales funnels. 
Now that you know what a sales funnel is, you put uh, prospects and leads into the top, then usually by marketing, they get um, um, uh, nurtured, they get um, measured, they get um, qualified, they get uh, put onto sales, sales picks them up, sales advances the, the, the sale, and then eventually closes the sale and, and the leads that we put in the, into the top, some of them come out the bottom as deals. Now, the old sales funnel was actually called the leaky funnel because some of the leads leak out and don't turn into sales. And, and the idea is that we really want to be so good that the majority of those leads that we put into the top come out the bottom as, as sales. And, and so I have some gripes with the old sales funnel. Firstly, it's, um, it's now, um, it was developed in last century. So it's last century's thinking, not uh, 21st century's thinking. The, um, the way it worked is it's, it's not really a leaky funnel. It's more like a colander where the, the water just, uh, and the leaves just drop through. My biggest problem with it is that it was always inward looking, right? It, it was looking at how we want to sell and how we want to measure our sales structure and our sales uh, process and, and how we're advancing through that sales process. But it was really not about the customer, right? It was, it was really um, looking at how do we want to sell rather than how does the customer want to buy. And the biggest problem, that's the biggest problem for me right now because in the current selling environment, we really need to be very customer focused. We need to help the customer to buy from us instead of selling to them. And, and uh, I, I, you know, I wouldn't mind if I get some uh, feedback from you in terms of your own experiences in your business today, what, um, what uh, you're experiencing in terms of, um, you know, whether uh, something that you did last year still works or not. So the modern sales funnel, as, as I see it, is much more customer focused and not vendor focused, not seller focused. As a consequence of that, it caters better to the buying requirements of the buyer gives you superior prospect engagement, actually engagement rather than selling, which is um, a, a big a thing I'm big about, which makes it less leaky, which means more sales come through faster and few of them drop out through the, uh, through the leaks in the funnel or, or the holes in the colander. It does have 10 steps in it, uh, which is more than the, the previous sales funnel, but those 10 steps are each carrying individual purpose and value for the buyer and which makes it easier for you to sell and overall it's just uh, bringing 21st century into a last century concept i hope that makes sense okay so in the invite to today's session we promised you three key takeaways and they were to set yourself up for a renewed sales uh, revenue growth. So that's, that's quite a, a big statement and I hope uh, that I can uh, do it justice. But uh, if, if you bear with me until the end of the session, I think you will find that um, it does ring true and it does add value to you. And there's actually going to be a special offer at the end, which is the, the norm I know, but um, the, uh, I just want to give, give you the value first and then tell you where you can uh, take it from there. All right. So then also help you to easily differentiate your business from your competitors and stand out from the crowd. And, and how we do that is going to be quite different to the way that you think. I think that uh, it, it, you'll find that part very interesting as well. And falling in with that, it helps you to then fend off your competitors. And also because you fend off your competitors, you accelerate your sales. So that's the, my promise to you that I'll deliver on those points and you can be the judge on whether we do that or not. So if, if we look at the sales funnel right at the top, it said brand promise. So what, what I mean by brand promise is not the shape or color of your logo or, um, or your, you know, your, your mission statement or vision statement. It is, what can a buyer reasonably expect from doing business with you, right? And I'd like you to think of a tagline or some sort of motto that you could introduce into your business that makes it very clear to, the, to, to a potential buyer, to a prospect, what 
they can reasonably expect from you. So I don't want it to be motherhood like, um, you know, we, we, we always care for our customers. Yeah. But uh, it needs to be more specific, you know, and it needs to be authentic and it needs to ring true for your business. And not only do you have to say it, you have to mean it and you have to live it. So, so the experience that you're promising to the customer needs to become reality for the, for the customer when they do engage with you. Right. Uh, it also means sort of what does our business stand for? What's our value? You know, so if, you, if, and also you could go with uh, Simon Sinek in terms of um, asking why, you know, why do we exist? Why did we decide to have this business? Why did we start out? You know, so, so think about the benefits to the customer um, of, of um, doing business with you. And of course it needs to be authentic, right? So I should have probably said right in the beginning that um, part of my service is to help you set up, streamline, accelerate, close gaps in your sales funnel. And so this is part of the work that I do with my clients to, to help them understand what that tagline should be that helps them to, helps their customers to understand what to expect when doing business with them. All right. Number two, you you probably have a very clearly defined and distinct product or service, but I've put this in here because very often we know as, as the seller and as the founder and as the, the people being in the business, we, we know what that service looks like, what it is or what that product is or what it, what it does for the client. But we don't sometimes realize that when we turn around and when we look at the buyer, that they haven't actually got the same clarity that we do. So I've put it in here just to help you to think about how well can you articulate your product or service to the buyer? You know, how clearly can you explain to, can you explain to it? And very importantly, will our customers understand what it is that we're explaining? And how can we avoid talking about our product and service, not in terms of the features, but in terms of the benefit that it creates for the customer, which um, brings us to, to number three, which is probably the most important point out of the 10. It's the one that my clients ask me the most about and that they, they always say that um, they could um, do with a bit of help on, on, this, uh, on, on, on this front. And I, and I might actually make a suggestion to you here. If you want to make a note for yourself while we're going through this, in terms of points one to 10, in terms of A, do we have this perfectly under control, this point, each, each of the 10 points? B, could it still be, could it still do with a bit more work? Or C, Peter, what are you even talking about? We haven't got this in our business, we're, we're still missing it. Right. So if you just um, take a bit of a snapshot for just for yourself in terms of how, where you are on that spectrum in for each of the 10 points, it'll, it'll probably help you make, uh, make it clear in terms of where you need to do a bit more work um, on your own sales funnel. All right. So I, a USP um, needs to speak about the benefit to the client, to the buyer, not not what we want to, not what our product looks like or, or what the features are, but what it actually does for the customer, right? And it needs to talk about how is our business different from any of our competitors or any other businesses that are like us out there. But not only do we need to have that clarity, we also need to be able to convey it. So it needs to be clear to the buyer what makes us different and why they should engage with us as opposed to anybody else that they have a choice of engaging with. And the third point is very important to me. I have this philosophy that we need to earn the right to sell to our clients and to our prospects, right? And we haven't earned the right to sell to them until they have asked us to tell them more, right? And in order to get them to ask us to tell, more, to tell them more, we need to create what I talk about Talk, I talk about the lean forward moment. So if we can have one sentence, one starting 
proposition, one line that we can use that gets them to lean forward and say, tell me more about that. At that moment, they've given us the permission to sell, not before. At that moment, do they understand that, it, that we are worth spending that time on us and to, to um, allow us to tell them more about who we are, what we do, and, and what our services and um, products are, right? The question then is, how do you create that, uh, that lean forward moment? What is that one sentence that can bring out the lean forward moment in your, in your prospects, right? So when you reach out to your prospects cold, through social media, through LinkedIn, through emails, um, maybe even, even cold calls. I'd like you to consider not talking about yourself. One, one of the 165 articles that I've written on, on, on LinkedIn and uh, some of them are on, on the website um, is called No More We We. No, no More We We Syndrome, right? And when I say we, we, I don't mean anything to do with nappies um, or, or little things. Uh, I, I'm talking about no more. We are this and we do this and we have all these clients and we are so great you should buy from us. Because what we should talk about when we talk about our USP or our value proposition is not about us. We should talk about you, the buyer, the customer, the prospect. You know, we should talk about what's in it for you. Right. And so that takes a bit of careful analysis in terms of what is the essence? What is the essence of what you're selling? Right. So if you're selling life insurance, which I know you don't, but I'm just using it as an example, right? You're not actually selling life insurance. You're selling peace of mind for your buyers because they know that if something happens, then they are protected and, and um, you know, they're not going to be lost. Right? So I'd, um, I'd like you to think about your own products and services in terms of um, what does it do for your clients? What is, the con con <laughs> what is the consequence of that thing that it does for you? Right. So um, another article I wrote was about the, uh, the benefits of the benefits. And I talked about um, a, a, a client of mine that runs a cleaning business. And um, they, they, they specialize in cleaning schools. And by way of an example, what they, they said, they, they talked about how good their cleaning is. Right. They talked about, you know, all the different uh, chemicals that they use and that they're environmentally friendly and not toxic and you know, not dangerous to the, to the teachers and staff and, and, and the school kids. But they didn't really get the, um, the essence of that because by talking about a cleaning company, talking about cleaning, it's not really something unique. You know, it wasn't really creating a lean forward moment. So, so people were saying, so what? You know, there's plenty of cleaning companies out there. So what we went through the process is that one of the many things that they do in schools is that they remove graffiti. And what does graffiti do? So you think about as a parent, a school kid's parent, you, you go and have a choice of a few schools in the area and you see a school and the school is covered in graffiti, you, you automatically think gangs, um, illicit substances, dealing and basically all those sort of things that you don't really want uh, your children exposed to possibly, right? You also think about the school from, from the school's perspective, what type of teachers do they attract when it looks like a, a druggy school versus one that's clean and, and presentable, right? So actually the, um, the, the benefit of the benefit of the cleaning was that it actually presents a better image of the school to the parents and the, and the children but also to the staff and to the, to make them a good um, a, a, a choice of um, an employer of choice. And so it, it actually does more than the company actually does more than cleaning. The, the company actually creates good first impressions and, and lasting impressions. Right? And so if you can articulate that in a way that draws a buyer in and says, mm, tell me more about that, then, that's a killer introduction that you can use. Now I'm just going to pause because there's a bit of a chat thing here. 
Um, so thank you very much, uh, Vikram. He's asking a question, so I'm going to try to answer that now. And what if he's asking, what if the company has multiple products, uh, then how to build their USPs and separation in their customer's mind? Okay, Vikram, very good question. And the answer is simple. If you go back to marketing 101, um, I'm talking about where you go and you look at the, your target, mar or look at the market in its entirety, and then you go segmentation, targeting, positioning, where you segment the market into all those different segments that you could address. And then you select the targets that you find attractive for your product. And then you position yourself to be attractive to that market segment. It is entirely okay that you have multiple market target segments for multiple products and that you have multiple USPs, one for each of the segments and one for each of the products. So it's entirely uh, congruous that, that you can have multiple USPs in multiple sectors, but of course the USP must be relating and make sense to the market sector that you, and, and the target audience that you're speaking to. So I hope uh, Vikram that makes sense to you, right? So um, please uh, keep those um, comments coming. Thanks Vikram, he says it makes sense. <laughs> awesome, thanks very much. All right, so this is possibly, as I said in the beginning, this is possibly the most important and vital point to get right. Because from, from once you have a unique value proposition, all sorts of good things happen in your, in your outreach. You, you will get much more, um, much more uh, um, uh, solid contact with your target audience. Your opening rates will be much better and your, your engagements will be much better as well. And, and we'll, when we get to point six, we'll, we'll come back to point three as well. So how, how are we doing so far? Does it make sense? Can you just uh, give me a bit of feedback because I can't see you and I can't uh, see your responses. So if you just um, type it into the, uh, into the chat box or into the question box, that'll, that'll be great if you don't mind. In the meanwhile, I'll, I'll move on to number four. It's very important that we know who our ideal customers are, right? And I've put some questions up for you here. And, 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 and the reason for that is that simply we want to speak to people that, that are likely to buy our products or services. There's no point talking to somebody who's got no interest in what we're selling. So we need to be clear in terms of who they are, who are the ones that, that the people that uh, would like to buy our product, right? So we're talking about, you know, who are those, those decision makers? Is, it a, is, there a, um, is there a mystical one single buyer or is there perhaps a panel is there perhaps a, um, a committee of buyers, right? What are their job titles? So I think it's corporate executive board, an American analyst firm that said that on average now it's um, 6.2 buyers involved in a complex um, purchase, right? So if you're buying a, um, a new IT system, a CRM system, a, um, a, you know, some, some piece of complex software that's uh, enterprise wide, you're likely to have multiple decision makers involved simply because it defrays the risk of one person getting it wrong, but also it, uh, it helps um, viewing the same offer from multiple vendors through different lenses. And what do I mean by that? Well, you might have a financial buyer. So somebody like a financial controller or a, or a CFO <clears throat> that would look at the, your product or service through the lens of, is there a good return on the investment? does it comply with my requirements for the internal rate of return? Yeah. So if that would let, look at it, no surprise from a financial perspective. Then you might have a, um, a CEO buyer, you know, and they would, they would look at it differently. They, they would say, okay, will it, will, it, will it work? Will it make me look good to the board? Will it make the shareholders happy? You might have a technical buyer like a CIO or a, an IT manager, for example, and they would look at it from a different perspective. Again, they would say, what is the support like? Is it going to give me any problems? I don't want any more problems. I've got enough problems already. If, it, if it's going to give me problems, I don't, I'm not going to go and uh, recommend this particular vendor, right? Again, what's the support like? If something goes wrong, will they stand by my side or will they start pointing the finger at somebody else and we won't get the solution on this? So point I'm making is that 
if there's multiple decision makers involved, then you really need to have a way to address their specific concerns in individually so that <clears throat> when they come together as a committee and they compare all the vendors to each other, they miraculously discover that you tick all the boxes because you've been addressing each of their individual requirements and concerns. And they all go, yep. Yeah. And they just, they just, just discover that miraculously they're all like the same vendor. And why? Because you have satisfied their requirements individually and they go, yeah, I'm happy with that, tick that box. Oh, I'm happy with that too, tick that box. Oh, I'm happy with that too, tick box. Well, that's a no brainer, right? So that's why it's important that you know who your ideal customers are. And then of course you want to know about location and the, and the business size industry sector and, and whatever else criteria you, you apply, all right? So you got to know your personas and you got to know what makes them tick and you got to know how to address them in, individually with the information that they need and the, the concerns that they have. All right. So I'm just going to have a sip of water while, while you can type in and say whether that makes sense to you or not. All right, moving along. Number five, now we know who our ideal um, customers and prospects are, we need to know where they are. How do we find them? And of course, there's all sorts of um, options for you. You can, you can buy a list, you know, you can buy a, you probably get uh, offers like I do from companies from, you know, um, from Middle East and Far East, offering you the, 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 the lists that you can then reach out to, of, of people that you can reach out to. Um, and of course, the, the one method that's uh, quite commonly deployed now is, uh, is LinkedIn. So we want to know, now that we know who our clients are, we want to know where do they hang out, you know? But we want to know more. We also want to know what interests them, what influences them, whom do they pay attention to, right? Because then we can speak to them at a more individual and, and more bespoke level, ad addressing them as human beings and not just as a, as a prospect and as a number and as a, um, as a, as a part of my sales quota, right? Because I said it right at the beginning, our buyers don't want to be sold to anymore. They never did really, but we got away with it um, up until the end of 2019. Now they want to be guided, they want to be educated, and they want us to help them make an informed buying decision. Um, whereas I say it's our job to help them make an informed buying decision to buy from us, right? Because we want them to buy from us and not from anybody else. All right. So you can go on LinkedIn, you can get a sales navigator or you can, you can use any sort of uh, social media and you can find out where my ideal prospects hang out because just going back to number four, we've decided who they are. So you can run a search on those criteria there on LinkedIn and you can get any number of uh, contacts that you can reach out to, right? And the reach out can be, as I said on the bottom here, can be um, physical, can be online or can be virtual, up, up to you how, you how you do that, right? But that brings us to number six, how to access them, one. So we know who they are, we know, we know, um, we know who they are, we know where they are, but now we need to access them, get in touch with them. And not just that, we don't want to be rejected. We want them to engage with us, right? So that's two very important criteria there um, because it all falls over if, they, if we reach out to them and they don't respond to us or they tell us to go away or worse, right? So <clears throat> we need to know how to reach out to our prospects, get them actively interested in our goods and or services, and we need to be clear about how we're going to engage them. And is that 
way that we want that we want to engage and the best way to actually get their engagement from us like if, if we engage um, 100 people and only two respond not a good rate if we reach out to 100 people and 80 or 90 respond great rate right so we want to make that scalable and effective as well I said at, the, uh, at point three, I said we're going to talk about the USP again in point six. So I'm coming back to point six now, where we, we're saying the how you engage them is actually strongly related to the value proposition that you had originally, and very strongly, even more strongly related to that killer one line, one uh, introduction one liner that makes them remember, lean forward and ask, hmm, tell me more about that. Right, so it, that's why it's so critical to get number three right, your USP and your, your killer introduction right, because then it makes point six much easier. Yeah. I hope that makes sense to you as well, right? Now, I did mention LinkedIn, and the, the, the last bullet point I've got here is to just um, let you know that if you're looking for a proven structured way to engage your ideal prospects in a professional peer-to-peer -peer perspective from a from you being promoted as the subject matter expert that they that can guide and educate and and help them then uh, talk to me about that because i can talk to you about um, a particular way that you can leverage that service to uh, to achieve your objectives as well all right so very important that we know who our ideal clients are, where they are, and then once we reach out to them that we actually can engage uh, and not just access them, but engage them as well, right? So that's, that's very, a very important point there. Okay, now, this is one of the points that I um, promised I was going to address, and this is how to eliminate our competitors. I've, I've said here that rarely will we be the only ones in, in the race to a deal. A, a, a buyer will usually have at least two, if not three quotes on everything, right? Un unless you have a very unique product that just nobody else can provide a, a solution to, a, a service to. We, um, we will be amongst um, several vendors that the, the buyer will want to choose from, choose between, right? And so the question is, how can we fend off our competitors and become the buyer's one and only choice, the one that's left standing at the end of the day and gets the deal, right? And I said to you at the beginning that this is probably a little bit counterintuitive, what I'm going to tell you now. And, but I, I ask you to keep an open mind and, and, and just hear me out and consider it for yourselves. And that is to talk about risk. How often do we talk about risk to our customers? How, we, how often do we point out the risks that they are facing when we're, we're trying to sell our services or, or our goods? Most organizations I find say, Mr. Customer, Mrs. Customer, there is no risk. Look how great we are, look how many customers, how many you know, logos we've got and uh, how, how many installations or how many sales we made in the past and we're number one, two or three in the market or whatever and there, there is no risk, all good here, don't worry. Well, I propose that while everybody else is saying that, we can differentiate ourselves significantly by actually addressing it head on, upfront, without um, being asked. And here's how I suggest you do it. You ask your customer, your prospect, Mr. Customer, Mrs. Customer, would you agree that in every business decision that you make, there's an element of risk involved? Would you agree that in every business decision that you make, there's an element of risk involved? What are they gonna say? It's a rhetorical question, right? They're gonna say, yes. And they're gonna be wondering, where, is he go <laughs> where are they going with that, right? But, but at least they're going to be intrigued. So then you say, Mr. Customer, Mrs. Customer, 
Would you like to know what risks you are exposing yourself to in making a buying decision on this product or service, regardless of whether you buy it from us or anybody else? Would you like to know what risks you are exposing yourself to in making a decision about buying this product, regardless of whether you're buying it from us or anybody else? Again, what would they say? They would say, sure, I'd like to know. They still don't know where we're going with that, but they, but they go, this sounds helpful. So yes, I'll say yes. Right? So then you tell them what, what are the things that can go wrong? Right? And, and, and depending on what you're selling, all sorts of things could go wrong. I, I can't guess what they are, but I can tell you that at the very most basic level, the thing that can go wrong is that whatever you're selling to them will not do what they expect it to do. That it's, it's, it's a failure. It doesn't work. Right? At the most basic level, that's what can go wrong. They spend their money and they get disappointment. That's a risk. So then after you've said, well, you, you're facing this risk and this risk and this risk and this risk, then you ask them, is the customer, is this customer? Would you like me to explain to you how we mitigate people like you, customers like you, against those risks I've just uh, enumerated. And the customer will say, well, bloody oath. <laughs> I want to know not only what risks I'm facing, I want to also know how I can be protected against those risks and how specifically you are managing those risks for me because you're the ones who brought it up. Nobody else has brought it up. Everybody else has said, you know, things are fine and don't worry and trust us. You're the only one that said, I've got risk. And yes, I do want to know how to mitigate against those risks. And so then you say how you mitigate against those risks, right? And you've got to have a mitigation strategy for each one of the risks that you've pointed out. And to come back to the most basic fundamental risk that they have, namely risk of failure, you just say, well, we have a proven track record. We have testimonials, we have happy clients. We have a money back guarantee. We have a, a remediation process. We have a, a, a service team, you know, and, and all those things that you have in place that um, help you to mitigate those risks for your customers. You can then now, um, enumerate them. You can, uh, you can call them out for the customer, right? And as I said before, this is maybe a bit counterintuitive, but I guarantee you almost 100% that you'll you will be the only vendor of, of the kind of uh, service or product that you sell that will proactively talk about that the customer has risk. Yeah? Because it feels much easier to say, no, 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 no risk here. And Mr. Customer, Mr. Customer, you'll be fine. Right? But it's not the case that, that they may not be fine. And as a buyer, wouldn't you want to know what risks you're exposed to and, and how you can be protected from those risks? Right? So I'd like you to consider that. Is, is that... Um, is that something that's a bit uh, surprising to you, a bit unusual, a bit counterintuitive? If you just uh, give me a feedback here while I look at Vikram's next question. So Vikram is asking, with COVID-19 and a travel ban in place, how do you reach out to overseas prospects? High dollar value deals need face-to-face -face type engagement. What is the way around this? All right. So Vikram, thank you again for the question. And please, can I hear from some other people as well? Just, uh, just so we don't uh, only respond to Vikrams. And, and Daniel, thanks for your feedback, saying it's a great idea and makes sense. So hopefully you can use it in your own business and, and win some deals that way. All right. Back to Vikram. The, um, because everybody is working remotely and, and working from isolation, um, it's actually leveled the playing field for everybody, right? Because online, like us here today, you can reach out to anybody in the world at any time and have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, right? I'm, I'm actually quite glad about the numbers of, of coffee that I don't have to have with people sitting in cafes um, because my caffeine consumption was, was actually quite high. 
And I find it, I, you know, I, I don't have a problem with uh, Zoom or any online meeting platform because I, I think it's, it's really convenient. You know, I, there's, it, it, I can forego the com commute. I'm not constrained to uh, a geographic location and, and I can ha have it any time of the day, right? So with dealing with different time zones, for example. So, so Vikram, my, my point is just because they're overseas doesn't make them less accessible. I, I think, again, um, the, the, the buying environment is such now that because we conduct so much stuff online, it feels actually quite natural to be, to be reaching out to people. So I, I had this morning, I had a call with somebody in the States and they didn't think twice about it that I was from Australia. They, they just saw me online and we could talk, talk, have a real time conversation. And, and yes, you know, they might have thought I have a funny accent. But the, um, but the idea was that uh, it, it was a natural conversation. So, so Vikram, if you just follow those principles that I just pointed out, that know who your customers are, have a value proposition, know where they hang out, know how to um, um, contact and engage them, you can do that online, you know. So the, 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 the tyranny of distance, the, the ge geographic disadvantages that Australia used to have is actually, you know, I think uh, pretty well mitigated. So I hope that uh, that answers that question for you. Lucky number eight, how can we use our sales proposals to win? <clears throat> so uh, the reason I talk about sales proposals because if, if you're in a, in a B2B context and you're selling something of reasonable value, you will be asked to submit a written proposal and you might even, um, you might even respond to a tender. Uh, very, very rarely will you be the only one that's submitting a proposal. Uh, you're likely to be in some sort of contest. So how can we set ourselves apart when we're being asked to submit a proposal? And importantly, how can we make sure that A, the buyer is serious about our proposal and B, that they actually consider it seriously, right? I'm not, in this case, talking about the content of your sales proposals. Of course, you should have a value proposition. Of course, of course, you should talk about risk mitigation, and of course, you should have um, you know um, competitive pricing in there. But um, in this case, <clears throat> pardon me, not talking about what goes in to your proposals, but how you use the proposals to create a differentiated advantage for yourself. So let me explain. How do you feel, actually type that in, type that in. How do you feel if, if, a, if a customer reaches out to you and says, John, Jenny, send me a proposal, right? How do you feel about that when they ask you for a proposal, right? Just, just type that in now. I'll, I'll just wait five seconds. Okay, so I've got a couple of answers here. Thank you, Anita, for chiming in, and Vikram, very diligent. Um, the, um, somebody's, uh, Vikram is saying it's, uh, they're, they're digging for a lowest price, which could well be the case, right? Um, Leo is saying, well, it makes me feel like we're just a commodity. Uh, Liz very um, smartly says, are they serious about this? Or how serious are, are they about this, right? And uh, Anita said, like, I want to get out straight away and uh, I'm thinking about what info I need to provide. Okay. So the instinctive reaction of every salesperson and every business owner and, 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 and every CEO is, great, they've asked for a proposal. That's, that's a buying signal. So they are serious about us in some way, shape or form. They want, they're interested in what we have, right? From the buyer's perspective, though, that may not be the case at all. You know, they may in fact already have decided who they're going to go with and they just have, have this requirement that they need to have three quotes. So how can you find out whether how serious they are about you and whether your proposal is actually important to them? Right? Here's what you do. Let's say the buyer's John. 
you say, great, John, that's great that you're asking for a proposal. Fantastic. We'll prepare one for you and we'll have it ready for you by Thursday of next week. So, right. How about we get together at 2 p.m. on Thursday in another call to, to, uh, um, for, you, for me to take you through our proposal because it is very important to us that our proposal hits the mark for you and we want to make sure that it's, it's uh, ticking all the boxes for you and we haven't left anything out, right? So we, we are very concerned that our proposal must meet your requirements. So therefore, would it be okay if we meet at 2 p.m. next Thursday um, on, in a call to um, go through the proposal together and make sure it ticks all the boxes for you? John might say one of two things. If John says, Yep, that's great, Peter. Let's meet at 2 p.m. next Thursday or uh, 4 p.m. is better or whatever. But he agrees to the, to the walkthrough call. What does it tell you? Well, it tells you that John is actually interested in spending more time with us and therefore he must be reasonably serious about our proposal, right? Plus it gives us another bite of this cherry because we get to speak to John again with our proposal and about the proposal and we can, he can give us his feedback and he can say, ah, that's not actually what I was looking for or that's exactly what I was looking for. And we get that feedback before we've formally submitted it, right? So it gives us again, another bite of the cherry. But what if John doesn't say, yeah, yeah let's, let's meet at 2 p.m. on Thursday. What if John says, yeah, just send in the proposal, it's okay. You know, all sorts of alarm bells should go off for you. <coughs> alarm, alarm. They're not serious, right? They might already, like I said, have decided who they're going to buy from and we're just making up the numbers. So what do you do there? My suggestion is to do this. They say, just send in the proposal and no need to, to go through it. We'll, we'll take it from here. You could just send in the proposal and cross your fingers and hope for the best, right? That's, that's a choice you have. But you could also try to get yourself another bite at the cherry. And, and you do that by sending in the proposal, but you do not date it. You do not time bomb it. You do not sign it. You write draft all over it in, in watermark and you leave out all pricing and you send it off. I guarantee you that if they're half serious about you, they will come back to you and say, that proposal that you sent me, it's, it's got my pricing in it. Right? And you can say again, oh, John, that's because we're very concerned that uh, our proposal hits the mark with you. And I just wanted to make sure that the terms and conditions and everything that all the product descriptions and everything else actually um, gels with your requirements before we put the pricing forward, because quite frankly, there's no point putting a price forward if it doesn't meet your requirements. So hopefully John will see that you're actually concerned about doing the right thing and he'll come around. If John says, ah, oh, look, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that feedback, right? then you know you're on a winner or at least you're in with a good chance. If he still says, no, nah, I'm, 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 I'm over this, just send it through and you're bloody hell, what are you doing? You know, holding the show up and, and wasting my time. You've got a choice to make, right? You can, as I said, just send the proposal in with the pricing intact and the, and the time bomb and the, and, the, and the signature in place and cross your fingers and hope for the best. Or you can decide to, to stay on your, um, stand on your principles and say, John, we feel very uncomfortable sending in a proposal that we don't love and it um, matches your, your needs and requirements. I, I think we'll, uh, we'll leave it on this occasion. Right? Now, John may be so impressed with that, that he actually gives you another bite or you just don't bid, right? That's entirely your choice. You need to um, weigh that off against the situation that you're in but at least it gives you another couple of chances of getting John engaged, paying attention to your proposal, perhaps correcting something that you've misunderstood or adding some information that was still missing. Right? So number eight, 
is not about what goes into the proposal, it's about how you handle the proposal when you're being asked for it. Because there's nothing worse, well, probably a lot of things worse, but uh, for a salesperson, nothing worse than sending in a, in a proposal and then there's crickets, right? Crickets, nothing comes back and you go, didn't they get it? Didn't they read it? Have they already decided with somebody else? You know, what, what's going on? And, and, and that uncertainty is, is really terrible because you don't know, you know, then your instinct is then to start chasing them, you know, chasing them down and, and saying, oh, just following up on a proposal, what do you think? And, 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 and you don't know, are, they, are you bugging them? Are, do they, are they looking for more information? And, and you've lost control, right? So this method that I've just described to you um, gives, gives you another couple of bites of the cherry and helps you to, to stay in control. All right. The next two points are quite straightforward. In an era where we need to differentiate ourselves, we need to stand up from the crowd, we need to do the right thing, and we need to comply with what the customer wants, customer experience is very important, right? And the customer experience is not just with your website, and the customer experience is not just with your salesperson. It's also with your service delivery, and it's also with your, the way that you invoice them, the, any sort of touch point that you have with the, with the customer, you need to consider what is their experience like in doing business with us, right? How successful are we in managing the, their, their expectations and their interactions? And how do we know how well or not so well we're doing in terms of our interactions, right? And there's, there's all sorts of things you can do like that promoter score and stuff like that. But the point I'm making down the bottom of the slide here is that our customer's experience is now super critical to our selling success. So please pay attention to the, your customer's experience at every touch point that they have with you. And that leads then to customer advocacy because happy customers are referring customers. You know, they, they, um, they become advocates and they become champions of your organization. And not only will they buy from you again and again and again, they get repeat business, but also they will recommend you to their contacts and their colleagues and their peers and their friends and say, these guys are really great doing business with, I recommend you, you, you check them out, right? And nothing's as strong as a referral, you know, um, because we can say all day long how great we are and how wonderful it is to do business with us, but it's not as strong as a customer saying, this is the experience I had and I recommend that, that you talk to them because they gave me such a wonderful experience and such a wonderful, result that I can stand behind my, my recommendation and, and, uh, and recommend that you talk to them as well, right? So again, customer experience delivers customer advocacy, if it's, if it's positive, and which brings repeat revenue and new business from new logos, from new customers, right? So, so hopefully that makes sense to you as well. Now I realize we've got five minutes left, so I'm just um, going to, come to my next point. And that is, <clears throat> that was all the 10 steps in the sales funnel for, two, for the 2020s that will help you to be more customer focused and get more sales faster. So I'd like you to, to consider how effective is your current sales funnel? Does it consider all those 10 points? If you, filled all those gaps in that you've identified, how much more revenue could you achieve in 2020 and beyond? And how can you achieve more success by looking at yourself from, from a customer's perspective, right? So hopefully you've, you've kept a track of each of the 10 points in terms of, we've got this perfectly under control. This might still need a bit of, bit of work or three, it's still missing from our business and, and we need to look at it, right? So if you could just type in for me, um, just make a traffic light, you know, um, red, amber, green, just type in red, amber, or green in terms of where you see yourself in terms of um, having a, 20, a sales funnel for the 2020s or not in your business. I'll give you 10 seconds to do that.
All right, I, I did expect <clears throat> that um, people would say Amber because nobody's perfect and nobody's imperfect <laughs> entirely. So thank you for that, for that feedback. But now that you know, um, you can ask me some more questions. And while you're thinking about additional questions, because you, um, you have a unique opportunity to ask me right now, um, questions that are on your mind right now. Um, but of course, I'll, I'll offer to, um, to make myself available to uh, answer questions um, after this, this event as well, right? And, oh, and thank you for those people that have, have not, that have chosen not to go with Amber. Good on you for being honest with yourself. That's, uh, that's, that's great. So, so self-awareness is, is always a good thing because that, that means that uh, you can actually um, do something about it. So, so good on you. All right. Now, here's a, uh, a question for you. If you would like to know how much more effective your sales funnel could be and you want to find out the gaps, the bottlenecks and the speed bumps in your own sales funnel, then, and do that for free and do it within just uh, 10 minutes, then I recommend very strongly that you download, you go to my website um, and to that uh, URL there, um, peterstrokeup.com forward slash sales dash acceleration and download the free checklist. So it, it describes the 10 steps in the, in the modern sales funnel for you and actually lets you answer those questions in terms of how well you're doing. And then you get a bit of a, um, a, a succinct summary of uh, where you're at in, in your own sales funnel. So that's that's something that you can do in your own time for free without my interference or, or interaction, and you can do it uh, self-assess it for for yourself, obviously. But there's more. Once you've completed this uh, this sales funnel checklist, I'll make myself available in a complimentary private advisory call with you to help you resolve one in the call, resolve one of the challenges that you have self-identified in the checklist, right? And you can just uh, send me an email uh, or text me and, uh, I'll, and we'll set up that call, right? So this is a free call where I may make my specialist expertise and my skill set available to you individually to help you solve one of the challenges that you have identified. A little caveat is that at the end of that call, I will make, um, we will have a, um, com a commercial conversation, right? So yes, it's a free call, but at the end, we will have a conversation about how could you take this further and how could you actually utilize my services, right? So that's the, that's the deal. Um, and I hope uh, you'll, you'll take me up on it by booking the free advisory session with me, right? Just uh, in closing, I have three webinars coming up in the next few weeks. Um, and <clears throat> the, the themes are here on the, on the screen. Five steps to reviving your sales growth right now. This is with uh, US-based business strategy guru, Christine Crandall. And she and I have um, um, spoken many times over the years and we hold similar concerns and values and beliefs. And we will combine to give you the best of our advice in terms of how you can get your sales growth in, in 2020 and, and beyond. Decide the true cost of not making a business decision is for those organizations that feel, and, and, and their, their founders and leaders, that find that the, the current sales environment is so, provides so much uncertainty for them that they don't know how to move forward and they're kind of stifled in their, in their progress in, in their decision making by a lot of uncertainty. And, and the idea is that in this webinar, I will tell you how you can get more clarity in order to make good and well-informed decisions in terms of how to move your business forward. Because the worst thing I think you can do in, the, in this scenario right now is to do nothing. You know, I hate it when people say, I want to wait it out, you know? Nothing's going to change if you just wait it out. You need to adjust, you need to adopt, adapt to the current environment to stay in business right now. And then there'll be a post pandemic business environment and you need to get yourself ready for that now, not wait until the crisis is over and then go, oh, what do we do now, 
right? This is the ideal time now to use the downtime that you have to review everything that you're doing, to look at whether it's still the best way to do it, to find better ways of doing things, and to set yourself up for success in 2020 and beyond, right? The, the third item there is forget lead gen. Uh, let's talk about sophisticated prospect engagement is about the, the LinkedIn lead generation or as I prefer to call it, prospect engagement service that I spoke about earlier on. So that's, that's specifically about that service. And then there's uh, you know, more than 30 other sales acceleration webinars that you will have access to uh, by going to this URL here and, uh, and signing up for my um, webcast channel. It's called this marketing channel for sales and marketing channel, right? The reason I'm laboring this point a little bit is that yes, you've got to leave your details and you've got to put a, a password on it and to, to sign up for the channel. But the, the benefit is that the five minutes you spend signing up will be compensated in spades by having the entire content, not of just my channel, but the entire Bright Talk channel, right? And there's, there's um, more than a thousand uh, uh, subject matter experts talking about how to do things better. And, and for the five minutes that you spend signing up for Bright Talk, you get in return access to that entire library. So it's, it's really worthwhile doing it. And uh, not just from my channel's perspective, even though I'd like you to consume my program, my content, of course, but from any other perspective that you're interested in, right? So sign up and reserve your seat to any one of those uh, three upcoming webinars, plus the 30 odd um, webinars that are already on there and that are uh, where you can still um, look at the recording. All right. So if uh, you don't have any more um, questions right now, then I'd just like to remind you of booking yourself in for the complimentary advisory call I mentioned. And, uh, and uh, I thank you for, for being here today. Oh, here's a question from Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Saying, what role do you see technology playing in improving each of the sales funnel stages? <clears throat> Excellent question, Daniel. Thank you for that. I, I actually should have mentioned that myself. So I have this um, very strong belief born out of hands-on experience over many years that technology is, is only a, a tool, just like a hammer is only a tool. And then you need a tradesman to swing the hammer. And it's important that the tradesman knows what they're doing, right? Because let's say if you're, if you're not a carpenter and you've got a circular saw, you can do a lot of damage with that saw, even though there's nothing wrong with the tool, right? So to me, just um, buying an app or, or subscribing to a, 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 a software license is only half, half the, um, the result. It's, it's always going to be a combination of people, i.e. skills, process, i.e. sales funnel, and technology, right? And in terms of the sales funnel, there, is, there are fantastic products out there. And if you want to know what they are, I'll be happy to elaborate on those in the, in the call that, that you booked with me, that can actually, um, it's one thing, sorry, it's one thing to get the process started and implemented, but it, it's a different thing to maintain it and keep measuring it and improving on it, right? Because you can very quickly lose momentum if you don't keep maintaining the, the process that, that you've implemented. So the technology is fantastic in maintaining the momentum, um, but, you, you, but buying the technology and then hoping for a miracle to occur is not it, right? You, you need to have the technology brought into an organization in a effective way so that the adoption rate is high and actually get, it gets used and, and it delivers the productivity that the, the Apple software promised. So Daniel, technology is absolutely important. It's not the only thing though. I hope that makes sense. All right, so um, one last reminder, if, um, if you do see the um, go jump on the webinars that I've uh, outlined to you, please uh, write them afterwards because uh, it's always good to know what, uh, what uh, people make of them. So that was, that's the end of my presentation. Anita, do you want to come back in? 
fantastic. Thanks so much for that, Peter. I was taking notes like crazy. It was a really, really good session. Um, and I hope, you know, people take advantage of the offer that Peter's um, so kind of put here as well. Um, and if you do want to revisit the session, it will be up on our website in the next couple of in the next couple of days at tankstreamlabs.com and a post email will be sent to those who are registered with Peter's contact details as well in case you didn't have time to write it down and everything else there. So thanks again for your time, Peter. Um, great session, great information taken there as well. And thank you everyone for joining us in this session, um, Lunch and Learn series, and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks okay. everyone, have a great day. Uh, thank you everybody and thanks Anita for having me. Welcome, bye. Have a good afternoon, bye-bye.